Okay. So, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, the warm welcome to everybody who's joining us today. Uh, my name is Leonard Planck. Uh, I'm a senior scientist at the Department of Public Finance and Infrastructure Policy at TU Wien, the principal investigator of the Fair Work Project in Austria and the moderator of today's session. Um, today, we're presenting the Fair Works course for Austria. As you know, the Fair Work Project is an action-oriented research project that sheds light on working conditions in the gig economy. The first evaluation in Austria was funded by the Chamber of Labor Vienna and the City of Vienna, who both um, play a very active role in promoting the use of technology that benefits workers, citizens, and society at large. To present the highlights of the research that we've done over the last year in Austria, we have the lead researcher of our project with us, Dr. Markus Krisa. Markus is a postdoctoral researcher uh, with the Fair Work Project uh, at the TU Wien. His research focuses on social and labor market policies with special emphasis on processes of social exclusion and precarious forms of employment. We are also honored uh, to have uh, three panelists who will discuss the report's findings and present perspectives on how to address the challenges of platform work. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Anna ritzberger moser uh, Anna ritzberger moser hello, is the head of the Director General uh, of Labor Law and Labor Inspection at the Federal Ministry of Labor. Previously, she was also, amongst others, the head of the Department of uh, Collective Labor Law in the Ministry and a lecturer at the Johannes Kepler University at Keynes. She's also co-author of several legal commentaries and also publishes uh, uh, on various labor law related topics in academic journals. We also have Christian Berger. Hello, Christian. Uh, Christian is an economic policy officer at the Chamber of Labor in Vienna. And he's also a lecturer at the Department of Socioeconomics at the Vienna uh, University of Economics and Business. His background is in anthropology, socioeconomics, and law, and his main work and research, in, research interest are critical political economy, particularly structural change and also industrial policy. And finally, a warm welcome to Martin Kowalizak. Hello, Martin. Martin is an associate professor <clears throat> at the Department of Labor Law and the Law of Social Security at the University of Vienna. He's inter alia. Uh, the national expert with the European Center of Expertise in the field of labor law, employment, and labor market policies, which advises the European Commission, including on platform work. He also has published numerous books and articles, particularly in the field of, of labor law um, and social law of social security. And last but not least, uh, he worked with us in the Fair Work Project over the last year, drawing on this expertise. So, I'm sharing my screen with you. Hope that works. Um, what's on our agenda for the next hour? <clears throat> After my introductory remarks, uh, Markus will present the research of this year. This will be followed by the reaction from our esteemed panelists. And at the end, we have uh, time uh, reserved for question and answers for the larger audience. To pose questions, uh, you can use the Q&A tab or alternatively also the chat. And you can already pose questions now, but we will take them up uh, towards the end of this webinar. Also for your awareness, um, the event or this webinar is being recorded and uh, will be posted on the website after our uh, conversation this morning. So let me start with a bit uh, of background around this project. The Fair Work Project focuses on how work is experienced in the gig economy. And our starting point in that regard is that there's a whole range of risks and harms experienced by platform workers. What sort of risks and harms? First, around pay. When workers are classified as self-employed, it's legal to pay gig workers uh, below the minimum wage. It's possible to pay, <coughs> to pay workers below the minimum wage. <laughs> Sorry. And so there are many, um, many workers who end up getting paid below the minimum wage. 
Second, working conditions. A lot of gig work is inherently risky. Delivery drivers weave in and out of traffic all day. Cleaning and care gig workers, uh, who are usually women, are also have significant risks associated with going into people's homes. If something goes wrong, if you can't work on many platforms, you get no income. In COVID, the pandemic has only amplified these risks, where workers face the risk of illness and at the same time also financial precarity. Third, management. There's usually no due process when it comes to disciplinary or dismissal procedures. Workers depend on platform, uh, workers who depend on the platform can be kicked off the app without any sort of fair due process if they get low ratings. And there's also a lot of research out there <clears throat> showing that women and ethnic minor minorities tend to get worse ratings because platforms end up reproducing our uh, biases as society. Fourth, individualization. There are strong and innovative trade unions out there doing important work, organizing platform workers and holding platforms to account. But overall, most platform workers don't have the sort of collective and uh, associational, associational power that we see in other sectors of the economy. So they are in a structurally weaker bargaining position, which allows platform to unilaterally degrade wages and working conditions. So as a reaction to these risks and harms, what we set out to do in the Fair Work project is shed light on work and how work is experienced uh, in the gig economy. So in the project, we first co-develop a set of fair work principles with the people and organizations that they impact on. We carry out research to evaluate platforms against those principles. And we use that research to give every platform a fair work score. This is a score out of 10, which my colleague Markus will explain more about in a few moments. Our hope is that the score spotlights where platforms are offering decent and fair working conditions and also shows us where that isn't happening. Also, the spread of scores shows us that low pay and dangerous working conditions aren't just accidents. They don't just happen. They're choices made by societies, governments, users, and companies. As you can see from that map, uh, we're an international network operating in 28 countries currently, including Austria. And today, we're releasing this first a round of research, the first scores for Austria. And to that end, I'll hand over now to my colleague, Markus, who will give us an overview of the research and the results for this year. Yes, many thanks to Leonard and a warm welcome from my side as well. Um, I'm happy to share some of our research findings in the following presentation. Um, but first of all, I will give you a brief overview of our research project and more details about its background. Um, let me start with the five fair work principles which underpin our work. Those principles were developed and repeatedly re revised through workshops in different countries with a number of stakeholders, like, for example, platform workers, trade unions, regulators, platform managers, and academics. For the Fair Work Project, uh, these five principles serve as basic standards which must be fulfilled for platform work in order to be categorized as fair. Um, looking at these uh, principles in more detail, they are, first of all, fair pay. Workers, irrespective of the employment classification, should earn a decent income after taking account of work-related costs. Second, fair conditions. Platforms should have policies in place to protect workers against task-specific risks um, that emerge uh, in the process of work. The third principle is fair contracts. So platforms should provide clear and transparent terms and conditions that should always be accessible to workers. The fourth principle is fair management. There should be a documented uh, due process for decisions affecting workers. And finally, the fifth principle is fair representation. Platforms should provide a documented process through which workers can express their collective voice and can be collect collectively represented. Um, next slide, please. 
So how do we apply these principles uh, to score the platforms? In order to do this, each fair work principle is broken down into two points. We, are, we award a basic point uh, if some basic conditions are met and we award an advanced point if more advanced standards are met. So every platform receives a score out of 10. But platforms are only given a point if they can demonstrate the implementation of the principles. This implies that the scoring is based on the evidence platforms are able to provide or the evidence we are able to gather. At the same time, failing to achieve a point does not necessarily mean that the platform does not comply uh, with the principle in question. It simply means that we uh, were unable to evidence its compliance. Um, next slide, please. So how do we gather the evidence? The Fair Work Project uh, uses three approaches to effectively evaluate fairness at work. Uh, so the first, uh, of all, so first of all, we start with desk research to find out which platforms are operating uh, in the country, as well as mapping the largest and most influential ones. But also to gather all the publicly available information relevant for the scoring process, as, uh, for instance, the contracts, the terms and conditions, and so on. Um, the second method is interviewing platform workers. We aim for a sample of six to eight uh, worker interviews for each platform, or six to 10 worker interviews. These interviews do not aim to build a representative sample. Uh, they instead seek to understand the process of work uh, and the way it is carried out and managed. Furthermore, it allows us to understand whether the policies we have identified uh, previously um, actually uh, are working in practice and how they are experienced by the workers. And finally, um, our th third method uh, is uh, uh, interviewing platform managers in order again to better understand the operation and business model of the platforms. This implies that we are approaching uh, platform managers and requests for evidence uh, for each of the fair work principles. In the end, we are putting it all together. Uh, that is, the final scores are collectively decided by the uh, fair work team based on three forms, uh, on all three forms of evidence. And the scores are then peer reviewed by the country team, the Oxford team, and two uh, reviewers from other fair work countries. Uh, this should provide consistency to the scoring process. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and next slide. So what are our findings for the Austrian platform economy in the year 2021? First of all, uh, our league table uh, shows that uh, for this year's scoring, we evaluated six platforms uh, from the food and grocery delivery sector, from the ride hailing sector, and from the cleaning sector. Uh, as you can see, the table has a huge variation in how well uh, platforms performed. Um, if you look at our league table, uh, we see at the bottom that there are three platforms that could evidence to be meeting one or two of the basic points of our fair work principles. Namely, these are the two ride hailing platforms, Uber and Bolt, uh, as well as the grocery delivery uh, platform, Alphys. Uh, then we have two platforms we awarded four or five points. This implies that these platforms uh, could evidence to meet more or less uh, all of the basic points of, of their work principles. More precisely, uh, these are the delivery platforms. Uh, this is the, the delivery platform Yum, which is part of Delivery Hero, and it is the cleaning platform Extra Sauber, uh, which is an Austrian startup. Uh, nonetheless, we have to underline that those two platforms only meet the basic points and none of the advanced points. And in the case of Miam, uh, not even uh, the basic point of the fair pay principle is met, which implies that it could not, uh, Miam could not evidence that all of its workers earn above our minimum earnings threshold. Um, finally, 
we have the highest scoring platform, Liferando, which is a delivery platform uh, and part of just eatstakeaway.com. Liferando could show that it meets all basic points and also three of the advanced points associated with our principles. Uh, this is primarily a consequence of the fact that Liferando provides all of its workers uh, with employment contracts. At the same time, it is also, so to say, a consequence of past struggles of workers and trade unions, as, for instance, the existence of a works council at Liferando in Vienna or of a sectoral collective bargaining agreement, the so called Kollektivvertrag für Fahrradboten shows. Um, so, next slide, please. So, if we look at the results from the perspective of the principles, uh, we can see that the fair Bay principle was one of the principles that was least met by the platforms. Only three uh, of the platforms, namely Liferando, Alfis, and Extra Sauber, could evidence to guarantee earnings above or minimum earnings threshold. And only one of these platforms, that is Liferando, could also evidence to guarantee wages above the local living wage threshold ensured by collective bargaining agreements. Um, the second and third fair work principles, uh, uh, fair conditions and fair contracts are more easily met by the platforms. However, while the basic platform, uh, uh, the basic points were awarded to several or even all six uh, of our platforms, only one of them, namely Liferando, could evidence to meet also the advanced point. Finally, um, only half of the platforms were able uh, to meet the principles five and six, uh, the fair management and the fair representation principle. Um, mm, but while the basic points associated with these principles were awarded to Lieferando, Miam and Extra Sauber, none of the platforms could evidence that they also meet the advanced points. This implies with regards to the fair representation principle that none of the platforms actually fully supports uh, democratic uh, governance. Uh, and regarding the fair management principle, only some of the pl platforms have, for instance, anti-discrimination policies in place, while the effectiveness of all of these policies remain questionable. So I'm coming to an end uh, uh, with my last slide regarding key uh, themes. Um, so what are the main themes um, that emerged uh, from our research? We identified a number of intersecting topics, and in this presentation, I want to focus on four uh, of them. First of all, uh, the results of our study indicate that location-based platform work in Austria is characterized by great heterogeneity. Depending on the business model of the platforms, there are jobs based on regular employment contracts on the one hand uh, and various forms of non-standard work uh, or informal employment on the other. Sometimes this leads uh, to employees working in the same sector or even for the same platform alongside persons working under a free service contract so called Freie Dienstnehmerinnen uh, or uh, self-employed persons uh, selbstständige. Uh, nonetheless, and this is our second theme, in Austria too, platform work is predominantly precar precarious work. Uh, in view of this, it is uh, not surprising that we have found an above average um, share of migrant workers in almost all of the platform studies. Uh, this is in line with the segmented nature of the Austrian labor market. Uh, the dominance of female workers uh, in sectors this, that remain uh, invisible, especially in the cleaning sector, can also be seen as an expression of a persistent gender-based segregation uh, of the Austrian labor market. Uh, which leads us uh, to our third theme, which is the topic of subcontracting. Perhaps surprisingly, subcontracting is an important issue in the Austrian platform economy. Uh, more precisely among uh, digital labor platforms in the ride-hailing sector, in the cleaning sector, and to some extent also in the delivery sector. Uh, in our discussions with uh, man platform managers, it was regularly 
pointed out that they insisted on compliance with certain minimum standards uh, with external contractors. All too often, however, um, this formal commitment was just that, a commitment, but not something necessarily undertaken in practice. Um, in this context, uh, it is nonetheless encouraging uh, that this is beginning to change. Due to newly developed audit policies for subcontractors devel developed by some of our platforms. Finally, uh, I want to highlight a fourth topic uh, in our key themes section, which is the fact that the aforementioned heterogeneity of platform work in terms of contract and employment types um, is not only uh, of relevance for current uh, regulatory approaches, whether at the European Union level or uh, at the level of the member states. Uh, since employment types and contracts are so different, the question arises whether trade union organization and collective uh, representation of worker interests is possible. This is also true for Austrian trade unions, uh, or maybe uh, it, is, it is especially true for Austrian trade unions, which are still struggling to find ways to successfully mobilize and organize platform workers. Um, we go into these topics deep, uh, more deeply in the report itself, but now I will turn over to my colleague Leonhard and the panel discussion. Um, you're muted, Leonard. Thank you very much for, <laughs> sorry for this uh, technical issue. Uh, thank you, Marcus, uh, for this very comprehensive overview uh, of this first year of research. Uh, and you can already find the layouted version of the English version research report on our website, um, where you can read more about um, or deepen some of the, the issues that Marcus brought up here. Uh, I remind you that uh, before we go to our second agenda point, which is the panel, that you can already bring up questions uh, in the chat or in the question and answers tab uh, or Fragen und Antworten, F and A, that you see at the bottom of the Zoom. <coughs> yeah, but um, that's our last agenda point. Before we uh, have our distinguished uh, three panelists, thank you very much again uh, for uh, being with us and taking the time um, to discuss uh, the report, the research, and bring your own views uh, on, on this issue. Uh, based on your experience and your institutional affiliation, I'll ask each of uh, you a broad question about the current state of the gig economy in Austria and also potential ways to move towards a fairer uh, platform economy. And you're, of course, more than welcome to take up some of the themes uh, that emerged from the presentation or also refer to inputs from, from the other panelists. I'll start with um, Dr. Anna Ritzberger Moser. Uh, as we've seen um, in Austria, there's uh, also, like in other countries uh, in the platform economy, various forms of non standard uh, work, particularly also more self employment. And the recent EU directive on improving working conditions for platform work sets out, amongst others, to address this issue. In light of this new directive, uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the plans of the Ministry of, of Labour or the government more generally? How does that affect um, the regulatory context uh, in Austria? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, we have seen in the presentation before that uh, many platform workers are confronted with really difficult working conditions and uncertainty. So the aim of the European directive, namely to improve the working conditions, is fully to be recognized. On the other hand, uh, the proposal for this directive um, deals with, with really complex issues uh, due to the different forms of platform work and also the already mentioned heterogeneous characteristics of platform work and the different labor markets in the member states. And this necessarily leads to a high need for discussion. The proposal, as you all know, is currently being discussed in the Council Working Group and in Parliament, of course. 
And uh, at council level, we expect a progress report at the next EBSCO and no general approach. So this means that the discussions will continue under the Czech presidency as well. The Austrian Ministry of Labor participates in the Council Working Group, of course, and uh, we don't have uh, any uh, specific projects at national level uh, so far. Um, national legislation depends more or less on the outcome on European level. Uh, concerning the proposal for the directive, uh, Austria has expressed a scrutiny reservation on the entire proposal and generally spoken, there's one idea, so to say, uh, we, we, we already have a, a very extensive body of law, of labor law in the member states and on European level. So we ask whether new binding regulations are really required or should it not be more important to, to concentrate on an effective and efficient enforcement of existing labor law. For example, when we address the, the problem of, of bogus self-employed, we might have uh, instruments in our law to, to, to fight this phenomenon, but the realization, the enforcement is, is, is a problem, problem. So therefore we are a bit hesitant um, um, to, to say there is need for new regulations. For example, we, we, we have to implement the directive on transparent and predictable working conditions this year until August. So there are also some points in this directive, which of course uh, will also help uh, improve the conditions in, um, in our sector uh, in platform work. But so we don't, we should wait for a, for a little, little bit for, for seeing the effects of these uh, um, regulations. Okay, concerning the proposal as such, um, I think one really crucial point is the legal presumption in at Article 4, uh, which states that the contractual relationship between the platform and the platform worker is an employment relationship. And this, of course, raises a range of legal questions. Uh, for example, how can such a presumption mechanism be implemented in the different procedural settings of the member states without afflicting their autonomy in this field? So uh, the idea as such is a good one, I would say, but how to implement it in, in different systems um, is challenging. And it still has to be clarified how to deal with the characteristics on which the presumption is based and how to properly distinguish platform work from genuine self-employed work, which still exists, I, I assume. Another important issue in the uh, proposal is the chapter on algorithmic management. Uh, with, for example, the obligation to inform on the use of automated uh, monitoring systems and or decision-making systems, and also to the obligation to monitor and evaluate the impact of these systems. Uh, these are core issues, um, but they are not only uh, labor law issues, uh, they affect the interface between labor law uh, as well as occupational safety and health, of course, and data protection. So these are very uh, complex uh, questions we have to deal with. So I think the discussions will still take some time. So that's for, for now. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much for your uh, precise overview uh, on the legal situation and uh, the plans. Um, we certainly will come back, I guess, uh, maybe also with Martin's input uh, 
for the with the discussion to some of the issues you raised. But I would like to give now the word to uh, Christian Berger, um, the Chamber of Labor, um, where you work, is one of the main pillar of organized labor in Austria and is uh, proactively addressing some of the challenges posed by the rise of the platform economy. Can you let us a bit tell us or let us know a bit more about uh, your approach uh, as an institution to improve the situation of platform workers, where the support of this project, the Fair Work Project, is just one of the initiatives that you undertake? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Leonard. Uh, also for the very impressive, insightful um, applied labor research uh, that you and your team uh, did and presented today. Um, my contribution will uh, be some kind of broad and will also um, classify the regulatory projects of the platform work um, in some regards, um, especially because our effort um, in the um, in the regulation of uh, platform work also aims at uh, a platform specific regulation and the um, directive is um, in our main focus at the moment. Um, based on the presentation of the results uh, of the Fairbook study, uh, it should be fairly clear, uh, I guess, that there is an urgent need for regulation. Uh, apart from the heterogeneity, uh, which was already discussed, um, and which is uh, typical for the platform world of work, I will focus on commonalities and some general aspects. Uh, I fully agree with the assessment that existing labor law should be applied and that there are deficits at the level of enforcement. That's uh, that's fairly true and a big problem. Um, these problems have to do with the systematic prevention of collective organization at the company level, um, which is um, observed uh, um, by the trade unions and also um, by the uh, Chamber of Labor, uh, but also with the market power or the market concentration um, of the platform companies. Uh, however, the platform specific uh, problems probably justify a platform specific regulation. Uh, Martin uh, will probably also discuss this uh, um, further on. Um, for years, um, NGOs, work uh, representatives, including the Chamber of Labor and also self-organized initiatives in many European countries have analyzed the developments in the platform industry. Uh, they have criticized the existing risks and characterized them as uh, social evasion, um, proposed an mm -hmm. EU legal framework with uh, minimum employment and social standards. And they have called for transparency and facilitation of law enforcement in connection with online platforms. That's the, um, um, that's the situation uh, and the European Commission um, reacted uh, to this many voices and uh, many court cases uh, um, in many European um, countries. Um, but the platform economy has long been seen um, as a field of, um, of digital technological and business uh, progress, innovation. Um, platforms not only make business easier for companies, companies that's fairly true as well. They also make our life easier, um, easier, especially for the customers. So they are also some kind of public uh, relevant infrastructure. Um, however, the platform logic also promotes anti-competitive growth models and precarious firms of work. Um, to make this more concrete, uh, the revenue in the European work and service platform economy grew from uh, 3 billion to more than 20 billion between 2016 and 2020. And the COVID-19 crisis has once again led to a further and even higher increase of revenues. Uh, the international delivery platform groups, although, although they are still posting uh, operating losses, EBIT losses, due to their radical growth strategy, have multiplied their revenues in recent years. Uh, and the critical point here is that these groups have now gained so much data power by the exploiting or the use uh, of the lock-in effects of the network and scale effects that they hold a dominant uh, and in some case uh, a de facto monopoly position in the market. Uh, these corporations own, uh, in some cases, the markets. They're, um, um, they, that means they own uh, 
guidelines, they promote their own guidelines, they enforce their own guidelines and also operating systems as well as their own contract templates. In other words, uh, they have considerable economic power. Um, this is the reason why we, in principle, welcome the efforts of the European Commission to launch also an initiative to enable collective bargaining for solo self-employed workers, um, which is an, an which is combined with the directive uh, concerning platform work for um, employees or potential employees. Um, According to the European Commission, um, um, for example, um, I would also like to, to uh, notice that uh, around 28 million people are already working via online platforms in 2021. Um, and also this figure is expected uh, to rise around 43 million by 2025. So it's also um, a large group in the European workforce, um, which we are talking about. It's not a um, a small phenomenon it's a it's a already big and even growing phenomenon and it's also notable i guess um because it's less frequently discussed um that the success of the platforms would not be possible without this human labor uh, this labor input in all this uh, um, successful technological um, platform organized processes uh, and the downside for employees is that the gray area between legally dependent and self-employed work has grown along with the supply and negotiating power of the platform companies I um, broadly described. This means that an even larger group of economically dependent workers is falling outside the scope of labor law. Uh, Platforms uh, often make the undifferentiated assumption that the people they hire are self-employed. They can do that because they have a lot of um, contract uh, contractual power, of course, uh, because of their market uh, position. Um, although the contractors or the contracts themselves are often classified, if they are, um, uh, are often classified as employees upon examination. Um, it is difficult to enforce the law in the, in, in the individual case. And in the past, legal constructions have uh, served to circumvent uh, the employment status of the platforms, um, which were common in practice, especially in the case of the messenger and delivery services or in the passenger transportation, um, as shown by the high, high, uh, highest court decisions all over Europe of the recent years. Um, so the European Commission reacted and uh, um, the Chamber of Labor, in the, in the perspective of the Chamber of Labor, the draft does uh, some justice to the demands, um, which were articulated by the uh, different interest groups, different uh, initiatives. Um, as already mentioned, they address three regulatory areas, uh, combating uh, bogus self-employment, creating more transparency and fairness, and introducing a comprehensive uh, comprehensive information requirements. Um, we think the draft proves to be a problem oriented uh, and thoroughly original in its policy approach um, and in the balancing of different interests. Um, at the heart of the legal text is the uh, proposed legal text is the presumption of an employment re uh, relationship or um, a rebuttable um, presumption of an employment relationship in the Article 4. Uh, according to this, an employment uh, relationship exists if, in the course of the platform's control of the work performance, at least two or five of the criteria listed in the Article 4 are met, unless the platform proves otherwise. Um, this is intended to effectively combat focus self employment regardless of the individual case. And we think that's an, a very important uh, mechanism. Um, the structural enforcement of the correct uh, legal status of persons performing platform work um, at first glance uh, fulfills a major demand of many who have been concerned with improving the working conditions of platform workers for years. However, the restriction to five criteria and the requirement that two of them must be fulfilled uh, seems rather restrictive 
the interpretation of the emphasized effectiveness um, uh, of the control options by the platform remain unclear and a critical view, review is still required uh, as to whether the legal presumption uh, is designed in this way um, relevant at all in the currently practiced models of platform work organization. Um, a catalog of criteria um, that is only exemplary, open and uh, dynamically um, designed and the fulfillment of only one of the criterion typical for platform work would probably be more in line with the con constantly changing and probably ever changing uh, platform economy. Um, the legislative proposals now presented on working conditions in platform work and the draft guidelines uh, on collective agreements for solo employed workers, which are antitrust uh, um, guidelines are important steps in our perspective towards uh, providing more security for employees in this sector. Um, unfortunately, however, the draft law, uh, the, pro the proposal uh, still contains a number of loopholes uh, that stand in the way for better for better working conditions or significantly significantly restrict the group of people to whom the legal regulations even apply. Um, this makes it all the more important for employees to be uh, to, to orient themselves uh, by the criteria and rating of platforms uh, of platform work uh, quality developed in the uh, Fair Work Research Project, which could enable and quality competition and even le leveling up the quality of work in the digital sphere and. One last uh, note, uh, the draft report published yesterday by Rapporteur Elisabetta Giolamini Jul is very uh, promising in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in this regard, uh, in regard to the loopholes I described. So there is still some dynamic in progress in the policy discussion, um, which we are, um, as the, as, as the uh, Vienna Chamber of Labor, uh, um, a part of. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, uh, for that uh, comprehensive overview and on the, also on the current uh, dynamics uh, on that crucial piece of legislation. Uh, and I immediately turn uh, to Martin Kovarizak for his input. Um, he has prepared uh, only two slides, but I'll uh, thank you, Martin. I'll hand over to you directly. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would actually love to comment uh, the platform work directive <laughs> or the draft uh, of the platform work directive and the two different positions. Uh, but I think I, uh, it's better to highlight another aspect on how to improve the working conditions of platform workers. As we see from the Fair Work Report published right now is that working conditions are not good. And interestingly, the Fair Work Foundation's approach is not we look into them who grants employee rights, but they look actually into the effect it has on the working and living conditions of platform workers. And in the end, the Fair Work Project doesn't care if you're an employee or not. They don't care if you're an employee-like person, an intermediary person, if you're self-employed. The only thing they care about is fair working conditions. And I think this is the correct approach. We should not stop at the status question, which is very much in the focus um, and of course, uh, and I will point this out, this is usually in most member states of the European Union, the access to the full set of rights. Um, as we have not developed a modern uh, progressive approach on who is to protect it uh, by um, labor legis legislation, we still have to struggle with the old ones. But I think the important thing is uh, we see that it's not easy with this platform work directive, with a draft. Uh, it has been presented in December. It has been trialogue now for five months nearly. And as we heard uh, from Anna Ritzberger Moser, maybe the European Parliament is ready to publish a report. Uh, and I think there will be a lot of discussions uh, on this report anyway. Um, there is not a kind of a, a consensus yet reached uh, in the Council of the Heads of States. Uh, in Europe. And I think there is still something ahead. And still, 
even if we have the directive, it takes two years. We have two years of time to implement it. So, and the people need it now. <laughs> it's, it's that obvious and clear. And I think there's another approach uh, which can also be taken. Uh, this is uh, trade unions organizing and self-regulation of platform workers. And interestingly, I want to point out, um, we saw it in the platform ratings already, Austrian labor law is extremely based on the traditional lotion of the employment contract. Only those persons who have an employment contract, they get the full set of rights. And this is especially important when it comes to collective rights, when it comes to collective bargaining and the representation at the company level. Because these collective rights, as they stand right now, only imply for traditional employees, not for the self-employed, and even not for the third category we have in Austria of employee-like person. Unless in Germany, where at least those employee-like persons are able to negotiate collective bargaining agreements, this is not possible for them in Austria. And collective bargaining is of major importance in the Austrian setup. We have no statutory minimum wage. We could easily maybe extend to uh, a set uh, of uh, employee-like persons, dependent, self-employed, whatever you want to call them. We need collective bargaining because we very much uh, are based on collective bargaining agreements. There's an extremely high uh, collective bargaining coverage, but only when it comes uh, to those who are uh, traditional employees. And we have sexual bargaining with employer organizations. Uh, especially when it comes to the platform economy, it very much makes sense to bargain directly with uh, the platform companies. Usually there's a monopsony. If we look at the markets, we see there's usually two big players. If we look at the transportation markets, it's Uber and somebody else. If we look at the food delivery, it's usually two. And if we look at the other sectors, we see there's usually uh, two players uh, which are relevant. So it definitely makes sense to negotiate with individual employers, especially when it comes to rates. And I think this is an obstacle uh, that might uh, justify a discussion if we, under certain circumstances, might not open up collective bargaining on the company level, which is also the basis actually uh, for the draft guidelines for the application of Article 101 uh, on um, the uh, antitrust law, uh, because this is enabling, yeah? This is not providing collective bargaining, this is just enabling it. This is just opening it up for three groups of people who are seen that they have not enough individual uh, bargaining power. Um, this is, economically dependent, solo self-employed, solo self-employed, uh, self-employed without employees. The second one is persons working side by side with employees. They work the same way with employees, although they are self-employed, just think of a uh, construction site uh, where we have the self-employed working side by side uh, with employees doing the same thing, uh, for example, installing insulation or whatever. And thirdly, we have platforms. And with the platforms, you don't have to prove uh, that you're economically dependent. It's, you know, there is an unequal bargaining situation and therefore you're allowed to bargain collectively uh, and um, the guidelines, they assume that you bargain collectively with the platform. And if we look at it, the only uh, collective agreements we have is the Danish Hilfe agreement uh, and it's a company collective bargaining agreement that opened it up uh, to the self-employed. So I think uh, the Austrian situation, although it's comprehensive and it's um, very uh, like it's very advantageous if you're a traditional employee, uh, if you're kind of in the gray zone, um, it gets a little bit uh, more complicated. The same thing applies to company uh, level representation. Um, we see uh, in litigation um, that the company level um, representation is at the workplace uh, in Austria, and uh, it's not very clear uh, when it comes to digital enterprises, what is actually a digital workplace. Uh, it's still a challenge, and we see with the Liverando, uh, you can read it about it in the platform, uh, in the Fair Work report on Austria, 
uh, it's still contested what's actually a digital uh, workplace uh, where work council may be established. And, but on the other hand, uh, it has to be pointed out, uh, they are strong co-determination right when it comes to employee control and data use. Uh, this is far beyond um, all uh, European uh, regulation. Uh, this is rather old, it's from the 1990s. Uh, and you could say that policy was very much foresighted. It was very progressive uh, because these are uh, legal regulations uh, you can also apply nowadays. And I think they could serve as a model. Um, the status quo as a starting point, And we see that Austria, the institutions uh, here in Austria uh, were used actually uh, by activists. Um, the first 2017, the first works council at Fudora, which is now Miam, uh, was established. And this was internationally uh, seen as an example of successful organizing. But this was because Fudora in the beginning used employment contracts. So to a certain number of their kind of startup core employees in the beginning, uh, some of them are still around, um, they were able to use uh, the Works Council system, which is only open uh, to um, traditional employees. And interestingly, Miam, and maybe also because of the successful Works Council, uh, now doesn't employ uh, their riders on employment contracts anymore, uh, but they use uh, a system of self-employed riders. We have a Works Council since 2019 at Liverando. It has been two times contested. Uh, the um, procedure is still ongoing, uh, so we see that it's not even where uh, the platform provides employment contracts. And Liverando is like scored the highest uh, in the fair work ratings. Do you, of course, because they are employees. And if you are an employee, you have fair working conditions because you are covered by collective bargaining agreements and by employment law. And this, of course, uh, is the best way into a good and safe and um, transparent uh, employment relationship. We have a collective bargaining agreement uh, for bicycle couriers since 2020. Interestingly, um, for the courier business, they were explicitly exempted from the collective bargaining agreement. If you were a courier with a car, you were included. If you rode a bike, you were excluded. Now they negotiated for it. Uh, the uh, courier collective agreement served as a model. And I have to tell you, this is not a good one. Uh, this is not one with good working conditions, not one with good uh, minimum wages. This is not like a classic uh, you know, metal workers uh, in a traditional uh, factory uh, collective bargaining agreement. But this is, of course, um, rather precarious work. Uh, so we see even where we have it, the bargaining power is not very uh, strong. And we see, and this is especially a challenge in the Austrian context, that the formal employment status very much matters um, to open up all these collective uh, mechanisms uh, that are available. And of course, we have rather low union density uh, which results even if you're organized in limited bargaining powers. Um, of course, we see that unions are now starting uh, to do something about it. I think the Riders Collective, um, an initiative, a very modern looking uh, initiative uh, by the transport workers uh, union is I think an important step. Uh, I think uh, they are raising awareness, they're organizing workers, uh, but they can only be a first one. Um, to uh, finish with my presentation, I think the main challenge in Austria, if we don't look for the legislation uh, to change the working conditions, but for organizing of platform workers, I think the employee status is also a challenge there. Um, and because this will not come uh, via uh, any European legislation, um, we should really discuss, think about opening up collective rights also to a group of uh, solo self-employed and the draft guidelines uh, of the European Commission might serve an example, who are those in need for whom we should open up collective bargaining agreements under Austrian law. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Martin, for that uh, very interesting overview and situating um, our uh, piece of research within the broader developments and the institutional relations systems, specifically um, highlighting uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of, of the Austrian system. These are be the challenges uh, that the platform work poses. Uh, since we're quite advanced, I'd like uh, to open uh, up and give the floor or try to bring in the, the participants here. If there are questions related to the research findings or if to our discussion here, uh, uh, please uh, do write uh, in the chat or in the Q&A &A or Q and a tab. So far, I haven't, I don't see any questions here. Um, in the meantime, there's uh, also uh, our colleagues at Oxford who posted the link directly to the report, which is easier for, or more convenient for you now to, to download, uh, and also the rating, which is online now. Yeah, um, I see here a question from our colleague, uh, Laura Fungel, where she asks, could you elaborate on the role of subcontracting in how far is it a crucial part of the platform economy and what can be done about it from a legal point of view? Uh, who wants to take that up? Martin? Uh, um, you know, um... Platform work is very much about evading uh, employer obligations because platforms uh, try to frame themselves as only intermediaries, as, as not uh, being the ones responsible uh, for the working conditions in platform work. And these employer obligations get diluted uh, another time if we use subcontractors, if we build in you know, another intermediary. And of course, the more intermediaries you have built in between the recipient of the service and the person providing the service, all of them take a cut. Yeah, they don't do this for free. So in the end, the money that is left to the platform worker, if there are more intermediaries, the less uh, the ends up with them. And on the other hand side, the harder it is to find out who is actually uh, the person responsible for good working conditions. And I think this is one of the loopholes in the existing uh, draft uh, directive uh, because subcontracting is not um, mentioned at all. Uh, there are no provisions inside in the abuse of subcontracting. Um, it only mentions the platform work is only um, deemed to be there if there is a direct contractual relationship between the platform and the platform worker. So it's very easy to get out. Uh, and we have seen this, maybe uh, Marcus uh, will mention this, uh, that subcontracting is one of the other black boxes uh, where it's extremely hard uh, for the platform workers to actually address their concerns. Uh, who is actually responsible for what uh, and who will resolve their problems? For example, uh, if a cleaner uh, is sexually harassed uh, at their workplace, whom they uh, can actually um, address their concerns. Uh, Christian, please. Yeah. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, based, us, uh, based on our um, consulting uh, uh, practice as uh, Chamber of Labor, we have quite uh, precise requirements uh, regarding the, the uh, topic of uh, subcontracting, uh, similar to the uh, construction sector in the uh, in the delivery sector. The platform world, um, a large part of the contract is awarded to subcontractors. We all know that, and uh, but then partly further uh, to another subcontractor. And the liability of the first contracting authority for wages could be an effective uh, measure to make uh, subcontracting subcontracting as a practice per se less attractive and to replace the responsibility for paying correct wages. Um, in German, uh, uh, Haftung des Erstauftraggebers. Um, und, uh, and, and another point, uh, also like in the construction sector, uh, the, the, the liability for social uh, security contributions um, is also uh, a very important aspect of social 
security uh, for individual persons um, per se. And uh, the Austrian um, ÖGK, the Austrian Health uh, Insurance, uh, has um, been much more successful in collecting uh, these contributions. It would therefore make a lot of sense as in Germany, uh, the Paketbotenschutzgesetz uh, um, to extend the liability um, of the area of the platform uh, world uh, um, staff. Um, yeah, that would, that would be my, my two contributions to this uh, subcontracting um, topic. Thank you, Christian. Marcus, do you want to add at this point, or maybe we take up another question uh, by our colleague from um, Germany, um, who asks to, to reflect a bit more on the collective bargaining agreement uh, and how it came to be in the context of Austria? Because compared to other European countries uh, where such collective agreements for platform workers don't exist or do not yet exist, uh, and what are the advantages it provides to workers? First of all, it's not a platform collective bargaining agreement. It's a barg collective bargaining agreement for bicycle couriers, uh, regardless uh, if they work over a platform or they work for a bicycle courier company or whatever. Secondly, it only applies to persons under employment contracts. So at the first glance, this looks like Oh, wow, we have the first uh, collective bargaining agreement for bicycle couriers. Actually, um, it's for all bicycle couriers, not only those working over platform. And secondly, it only applies to those uh, in traditional employment relationships. Uh, and therefore, yeah, that's the tricky issue uh, about it, because um, how did it come uh, into place? Um, it was very much based on the activism of those people who established the first um, works councils uh, at uh, such a delivery company um, and the union, the transport workers unions, who took up, who supported uh, these uh, works councils and then uh, took up the momentum uh, with the uh, works council, with the establishment of the works councils to negotiate for a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and I have to tell you, it's one of the few gaps in the Austrian landscape of collective bargaining. 98% are covered. They were part of those 2% who are not covered, you know? Um, and this is only a very small number, but it's one of the gaps closed. Okay, since we're already a bit over time, uh, I think we have can extend a bit for a couple more minutes uh, uh, to have at least one or more questions if, if there are. Or, and, and also, if you wish to have some sort of closing remarks from, from the panelists, just one uh, clarification in the meantime from the chat, I think a representative of Miam pointed out that Miam also, of course, offers part uh, per employment contracts and not only Freidienstverträge uh, or free service contracts as we have translated them. So um, if there are more questions uh, from the chat, I'm just looking here. Um, I think there's not much left here, but uh, yeah. So then I think um, I'll hand over to you if you have a final closing remarks uh, on the panel, uh, if you want. Uh, yeah, Ms. Ritzberger, please, yeah, go yeah, ahead. Just, just uh, the discussion was very fruitful and interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I think this discussion on, on the status is a really, um, um, yeah, difficult and, and, and also it might be better, as you, uh, Martin, suggested, not to concentrate on the status, but on um, uh, who has to be, or the, who should be protected, uh, ir uh, irrespectively, uh, whether it's in, in self-employed or work. But I think we are, this will take a long time. <laughs> To, to, to come to this, this discussion. Another aspect I wanted to, to highlight is um, uh, we also have to deal with um, relationships uh, cross-border. 
And this is an additional uh, challenge, I would say, uh, because if we work, uh, an, a platform worker works in Austria, uh, he might not have an employer in Austria as well. And this uh, is might be difficult for him, but also for authorities overall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Martin, Christian, you want to add uh, at the end? Um, just uh, to uh, second um, Anna Ritzberger Moser, I think um, this is why this discussion about platform work is so important, because in a way it's a test case. Uh, it's not only about platform work, but it's about the personal scope uh, of labor legislation uh, on the one hand side. And this is why the proposed directive that extends uh, a lot of rights, uh, most of the rights actually uh, also do to those persons uh, who work over platforms without an employment contract. Uh, and secondly, um, it's not only about the personal scope, but it's about algorithmic management. It's about automated decision-making. Uh, and even here, I think we shouldn't stop looking only at platform work because what we hear um, in the interviews, and I can only uh, recommend uh, to you reading the reports, there are worker stories in the report. It's a wonderful report. I've seen it first today for the first time, you know, in this wonderful layout. Um, it reads extremely well, thanks to Leonard uh, and his team. Um, and we hear that for platform workers, uh, if there is just an app that tells them what to do, it's extremely hard to deal with their issues. Um, maybe they have a phone number they can phone in. Uh, maybe there's a ticket system. Maybe there's a helpline uh, or whatever. Uh, but it's of extreme importance that we have, you know, human supervision. We have a human to talk to uh, when we have uh, issues at our workplace. And I think this is why, especially the Fair Work Report, which is not only just about numbers, uh, but it's also about worker stories, how they experience uh, platform work uh, in their uh, realities of life, uh, which makes it uh, such a wonderful project. Uh, and I think also a very colorful basis uh, for discussions um, and decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Christian, you want to briefly close? Yes, yes, thank you. Um... Yes, I can. I can regarding the the uh, cross border dimension. I can. I can also second what what has been said, and uh, I would only like uh, to add uh, the, or, or to make up the question of which platforms we, we will have to deal with in the future. And I guess that's some kind of fu fundamental question, and I hope uh, fairly regulated and at least. Uh, publicly responsible, managed, uh, and democratically, uh, and in, therefore, in a broader sense, economically um, higher developed uh, platform, which we can um, guten Gewissens uh, use as uh, infrastructure. Thank you very much, Christian. That brings me to the final uh, word. Uh, there's uh, um, the fair work rating that we have um, issue today um, is part of this larger research project and one of the <clears throat> things um, that the project all sets out is to highlight the good and the not so good practices and the good and not so good platforms at the current moment and what individuals can do is take a look at this but also not only individuals but also organizations like universities uh, the chamber of labor or local governments and can sign up to a pledge that they take this as a kind of guideline and try to integrate it into their um, operations as well when making choices about which platform to use in the future. So that's available on our website as well, the, the call to, to look at this pledge. And the last point for today is that this was only the first step in the dissemination of the report. Uh, and we are planning on launching uh, the longer German language version of, of our research for the first year. Uh, in a couple of weeks, and we plan to do that not online, but face-to-face -face, uh, here in Vienna, and uh, we'll keep you posted on that. But thank you again for every, uh, to everybody for attending for, uh, for this very interesting discussion.
uh, and sharing your views on the results of the first year of fair work in Austria. We look forward to many more. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.